Hey, I got no ball to take ball. Five. One to hold the white ball while the other pattern. <laughs> Did you hear the one about the Pope sending a Catholic presidential candidate all those bowling balls? Yeah, well, he wanted to make a string of rotary beads for the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> hey, have you guys heard this one? <laughs> Look, there's these tanks across the Libyan desert, right? One Arab and the other's Israeli. Okay, they're rolling along and they don't see each other, and bam, they run into each other, right? Okay, now the Arabs jump up out of their tank, and they see the Israeli tank, and they go, we surrender. The Jews pop up out of their tank and see the Arab tank, and they go, ziplash. There's this bar and there's nobody in the place, just the bartender. And the door opens, and in walks this big guy, and he's got a big alligator on a leash. And he walks over to the bar, and he says, bartender, he says, do you serve niggers in here? And the bartender says, yeah, uh, sure. And he says, fine. And he sits down, and he says, give me a scotch and soda, and bring me a nigger for my alligator. <laughs> Did you hear that women's lib finally got an airline to Truman pilot? <laughs> they had to fire her, though. It seemed as though the first time she taxied the plane down the field, she had an accident. <laughs> she, she said it wasn't her fault, though. Said she was just sitting there, minding her own business, when this other plane backed into her. <laughs> huh? <laughs> I got one for you. This rich white dude was barreling down the road in one of these big, long, white Cadillac convertibles going so fast, they hit these two black dudes who was walking down the road. Hit one so hard, went 60 feet into the cornfield, dead. Another brother up over the hood, down through the convertible into the back seat, he's laying dead. Honky didn't even slow down, he just kept going into the town. Ran into the town and told some sheriff, I've had some big troubles with some niggas. Sheriff said, don't worry about it, tell me what happened. So the honky told the sheriff what happened, the sheriff said, look, this is what we'll do, you can get justice here. We'll get the first nigga, the one in the cornfield, for leaving the scene of the accident. We'll get the second nigga for breaking an entry. Can you dig it? How'd you like the jokes? Were they funny? Did some of them rub you the wrong way? You know, there are some people who'd think that those jokes were signs of being prejudiced. Whether you thought they were funny or not, prejudice, real prejudice, can be very unfunny. Here, let me give you a hand. Hey, Jeff, give me these books. What's the idea? We're well, just trying to help. Just get lost, man. Just get lost. Thank you. You know how those Japs are, they're too polite and everything. You just can't trust them because they're sneaky, they're Japs. Hi, come on in. This is Bruce. What's the matter? I'll tell you what's the matter. I didn't expect to be invited to no African jungle tribal ceremony. That's what's the matter. Okay, I handle it, guys, huh? <laughs> hey, Linda, um, what you doing? Joining the Italian lady? Oh, no, please. Yeah, what you like, a spaghetti or something? Sure, sure, we like the garlic. <laughs> you know what'll make me puke faster than anything else? The smell of garlic on a wop's breath. <laughs> Oh, hey, wow, man. We can't play here. The sun's up there in our eyes. Right. Okay, we'll play at that end of the court. All right. Hi. Hey, why don't you guys take a taco break? Yeah, you don't want to play basketball. We weren't going to play much longer. You guys want to play a game together? No, we don't want to play with you, Pancho Bugger. Hey, Bob, he's only a kid. Take it easy on him. Hey, if you want to play with these dumb beaners, then you go to that end of the court and you play with them. Maybe they'll give you a taco for Christmas. Adios, muchachos. Vamos. 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 Hasta la vista. 
Hey, uh, could you tell me where the auto shop is? Nah, I couldn't tell you. Hey, could you tell me? I, we don't know where nothing is. <laughs> it must be on the second floor. Hey, man, it's on the second floor. Second floor? No, 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 no. That floor. was yesterday. It's on the third. Oh, floor. man, it's on the fourth floor, man. Ah, oh. oh, man, it's on the second. In the basement. In the, in the basement. basement. I saw a hubcap down there in the basement. It was there next yesterday. To, it's next door to the carburetor. Next door to the carburetor? Right, well, what right. about that hubcap downstairs? Oh, the bumper, man. The bumper? Yeah. Oh, man. Hey, where did you put the auto shop? Must, must be inside. Inside? Yeah, oh, inside. hey, man. Oh, it's the inside. Yeah, inside. Inside. It ain't out here. It ain't out here. Hey, okay. man, tell me, what's a dumb honky one with the auto shop? <laughs> he wants to learn how to empty the ashtray in his mama's Cadillac. <laughs> Obviously, prejudices come in all sizes, shapes, and colors, but why do some people still feel that way? Why is there prejudice of any kind? One thing's for sure, it's been around for a long time. Have you ever heard the expression, the Greeks had a word for it? Well, they gave us one word that's an excellent example of prejudiced thinking. Thousands of years ago, the ancient Athenians thought that anyone who didn't speak Greek, that is, anyone from a different country, was a foreigner and couldn't really speak. They simply made a noise that sounded like bar, 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 bar to the Greeks. They call this babaria or babarikos. Hence, we get today's word, barbarian. And to some people, being a foreigner and unable to speak the language automatically gets them a put-down. That makes you wonder. What if the great Greek philosopher and teacher Aristotle were to find himself in one of our restaurants today? His wonderful command of the Greek language wouldn't really do him much good. He'd still have a heck of a time trying to get a plate of lamb. Da, isila, ena, piato, paetakia. You understand what this guy's saying? Not a word. I just give him a cheeseburger. He'll like it. I hope so. If he doesn't, he can go back where he came from. One cheeseburger and a Coke. I don't know. What do you think we should get? Or how would any of us do who don't speak French? Trying to order from a menu that's all in French. It's a lot different. So strange. How about that? Poul ratai, or is that rati? I think it's poulet. It's got a thing on the e. What is that? I don't know what you're trying to say. Point to it. Poulet roti. She can roast it. We'll take it. Two orders. Merci. Two orders. How do you like that dumb foreigner? He can't even speak English good, and he looks down his nose at us. Right. I'm glad all French waiters aren't like him. We'd all be stuck with hamburger or roast chicken. We've just had a chance to see for ourselves whether two wrongs make one right. One, the waiter's impatience with the couple's inability to understand French in America. And two, their reaction to him as a dumb foreigner when perhaps dumb waiter would have been much more to the point, and not a sign of the same kind of prejudice he was displaying toward them. And when someone's prejudiced against some person or group just because he or she doesn't understand them, it's sort of like the old story about the three blind men and the elephant. Tis a snake. Tis a tree. Tis a wall. Of course, anybody can have wrong or incomplete information and form the wrong opinion, as our three friends just did. But you've heard the expression that none is so blind as he who will not see. Well, that's the kind of person you can beat over the head with all the facts in the world and you still can't change their mind. They'll drive you crazy if you let them. Make sense. I am making sense. No, you're not. Have you read this book? Oh, I haven't read that book, but I can tell you this. Jews don't worry about anybody else. They only take care of their own kind. But it says right here that the records of the community chest show that Jews give more generously to non-Jewish charities in proportion to their numbers of non-Jews. Exactly. And that's how they're always trying to buy their way into our Christian affairs, Cindy. You know they think of nothing but money. Well, that's why there's so many Jewish bankers. How many Jews have you ever seen in our local bank? I've seen lots. Besides, statistics show that the percentage of Jews in banking is much smaller than the percentage of non-Jews. Mm -hmm. And that's because they don't go in for big business. Because in big business, you've got to be honest. So 
collectively start their own business and become their own boss so they can jip you, me, everybody. Well, even the government. Oh, boy. It's like he's saying, my mind's made up. Don't try to confuse me with the facts. But the thing is, how does a person get that way? Where does all this prejudice come from? Where does it all start? Hi, I'm Sonia. Hi, Sonia. I'm Linda Williams. And well, social scientists pretty much agree that we all have a fear of strangeness, almost from the beginning. Left alone in a strange place or having a stranger suddenly reach out for them will usually frighten a six to eight month old baby. As the child becomes used to a stranger or the new surroundings, they lose their fear. Shyness with strangers may last for years, of course, but most of us can't help but feel a little uptight around people we don't know. Now, you take this fear of strangeness and add one other thing, the way a child is raised. Social scientists have found that children who are raised by over-strict parents, the kind who never seem to let their children do anything they want to do, you're so ugly, I've never seen anything so ugly. Will probably grow up kind of hating the world. These children, being unable to release years of suppressed angry feelings at their parents, will frequently, in later years, find an easy victim who's not in a position to really fight back. And then, of course, the parents may have prejudices of their own that they pass on to their child. You're no better than to do that. How many times have I told you never put nothing in your mouth? For all you know, some dirty nigger could have just dropped that penny. Okay. Very early fears, parents too tough, parents passing on their prejudices to their children. That's what the experts say are some of the main causes of prejudice. Of course, there are different types of prejudice in different people. Social scientists list them in different categories, something like this. First, there's the mildest form, which is the vocal. This is the guy who just badmouths the people he's prejudiced against. You're a wasp, that's what you are. Okay, so I'm a wasp, but that's what you want to call me. White, Anglo-Saxon, and Protestant. Beautiful. As far as I'm concerned, that's a compliment. Because we're the only people you can trust. But you're going to get Look, look, I'll do my hitch and stay out of trouble. I'm just not going to associate with those people. If you do, the first thing you know, the niggers, the Jews, the wops, the spicks, they all stab you in the back. Hey, look, there's one behind you now. Yeah, very funny. The next form of prejudice is avoidance. This is the person who will go out of his way to avoid whoever or whatever he's prejudiced against. We're not staying here tonight. This place is crawling with Jews. Oh, Harry, for Pete's sake, not that again. It's miles to the next town. It'll be night before we get there. I don't care. I'm not bedding down with a bunch of kites. Oh, for crying out loud, Dan. Hey, you shut up, huh? I'm paying for this vacation. When you pay, you can go to Israel for all I care. The next form of prejudice is active discrimination. This is where the prejudiced person tries to keep the people he's prejudiced against from going somewhere or from getting something they want or from living where they want to live. Joey, hey man, grab your garden hose and meet me in front of my place. <laughs> yeah, your hose. You remember I told you my dad's on the Neighborhood Protective Association? Well, there's some niggers planning to move into the old Johnson place down the street from us. Yeah, four of us are going to put our hoses in the mail slot, open up the windows and the air vents, and flood the place. That'll teach them jigaboos where they belong. The next form of prejudice is violence. This is where the prejudiced person will try to physically hurt the people he's prejudiced against. We told those spits to stay in their own side of town, right? Yeah, right. right. Well, they decided to see a movie on our side. They're in there now, and when they come out, we're gonna bust their greasy heads in. Yeah, yeah, right. The next form of prejudice is killing, murder, such as this lynching. Since 1889, there have been nearly 4,000 lynchings in this country, plus untold murders, burnings, and bombings. This is Auschwitz during World War II, where the most terrible form of prejudice took place, genocide, the extermination of an entire group of people. Here and in other concentration camps like this, over six million Jews were killed, and many were disposed of in ovens like this one. So there they are, only a few of the more obvious forms of prejudice, all the way from just bad-mouthing people to people sick enough to want to kill all the members of a race, a religious group. But it sure is weird how prejudice happened in America, especially when you consider that the Pilgrim, the original European settlers, came here to escape prejudice. But somehow we've never been free of it. 
almost from the beginning, there was prejudice in this country. First, against the very Indians who helped the pilgrims and kept them from starving the first year they were here. Then against the Africans, who didn't want to be brought here as slaves in the first place. And now, after all the 4th of July speeches, all the graduation speeches, all the campaign speeches, all the millions of words about what America stands for, isn't it really strange that those same prejudices against black people and Indians are still with us? Of course, when you stop to think about it, some of us right here may have had great-grandfathers who were slaves or slave owners, because it's only a little over a hundred years ago that slavery was officially ended in America. You know, white men were still killing Indians less than 70 years ago. Do you think Grandpa, the great Indian fighter, could ever have been convinced that he wasn't conquering the West for God and country? More often than not, what he was really doing was killing Indians to get their land. Or would great-grandpa, the plantation owner, have given up his slaves if someone told him that slavery was wrong and immoral? No way. In order to own slaves, the plantation owners had to convince themselves that their slaves were something less than human. After that, it was easy to spread the idea that black people's brains weren't as good as white people's, that black people were more like animals, beasts of burden, and like other animals, should be whipped and beaten by their masters. And the white man's view of the Indian as a noble savage could easily be changed to something worse, especially when he wanted the Indian's land. He could very conveniently begin to think of the Indian as a wild and dangerous animal that had no right to own all that land and had to be taught that lesson and be killed. When the Indian fought back, the white man said, see, there's the proof, we have to kill these wild animals to protect ourselves. And so the killing went on until some of these white men had all the best land they could get, frequently in government-sponsored land rushes like this. Of course, prejudice in America isn't restricted to blacks and Indians. America's been called the melting pot, the place where people from all over the world could come and be able to work, get an education, and have religious and political freedom. And strange as it seems, that's probably the reason right here for a lot of the prejudice here. I mean, when immigrants began to come here in a lot, a lot of different countries, usually they spoke different languages and they all had different lifestyles. So they did just what people have always done when they found themselves in strange surroundings. They stuck together. They called America the New World, but the very newness of it frightened them. So many of them fell back on the security of their old European ties. The early settlers even named their settlements New England, New France, New Spain, New Sweden, New York, New Jersey, and other European names. It's really easy to understand why they did that, but it was unfortunate too. You see, here were all these different groups, all of them living in tight little communities, very busy trying to improve their lives, especially for their children. But very few of them really understanding or trying to understand any other group. Naturally, tensions build up and prejudices were formed. And in all the years since, how many tears, how many humiliations, lost jobs, deprived families, and even early deaths have been caused by this kind of thinking? You know, 1976 is America's bicentennial year, 200 years of independence and freedom. But how close have we come to the real meaning of those words, independence and freedom, for all our citizens? Do we as individuals treat all other people as individuals and not as members of this group or that? Well, fortunately, there have always been a few people who could see through the smoke and the haze of prejudiced thinking and find the real underlying reasons for social problems and help solve them. I'd like you to meet one such person, professor of social welfare and sociology at UCLA and director of the University of California, Tokyo, Dr. Harry Katano. Doctor, would I be oversimplifying if I said that the social scientist studies people in the groups that we call society? Sure, I'll buy that. Well. Since we've been talking about prejudices and ethnic and minority groups, maybe you could give us a better definition there. Uh, of which 
of ethnic and minority groups. Oh, yeah. An ethnic group uh, is a group with a common background, common history, common culture, and that in our society they usually live somewhat separately and therefore they're quite visible and can be seen. Now, a minority group or a minority is simply one where there's just less of. For example, in our country, most people are white and Protestant. Therefore, that makes practically all others minorities. Uh, minorities can even be made up of tall people, short people, fat people, skinny people, because there's an average, and if you are not part of that average, then you become a minority. Do very tall or short people have problems with prejudice? You bet they do. Uh, for example, in the job interview, even if you have the same experience, the background, the qualifications, the chances are very good if you're tall or short or overweight or underweight, you just won't get that kind of job. In fact, in our country, women, who are obviously not a minority nor an ethnic group, are also victims of prejudice. Isn't that strange? I mean, why would men be prejudiced against women? We love them. I mean, we marry them, they're our mothers, our sisters. What are the reasons? Well, I don't think I can list all of them here. But it probably all began with the role of women as mothers. From the very beginning, the care, feeding, and raising of babies has been mostly the mother's job, with the father providing the food, shelter, and protection. Men have always been willing to do this so that the women could bear and raise the children. And because it takes so much time to raise a human baby, this has put men into the stronger or more dominant position. So he has traditionally resisted the efforts of women to be financially independent outside the home and has encouraged and limited her to remain first and foremost a mother and not much of anything else. It took marches and demonstrations for women to get the right to vote. And there was a time when men used to feel that an education was wasted on a woman. But recently, women have been encouraged to go into fields other than teacher training and nursing. And today, women are involved in every field of human endeavor, from conducting symphony orchestras to being a gas station attendant. But the old prejudiced feelings of male superiority are still there with a lot of men. Obviously, there's a lot more to it than that, but you get the idea. I get the idea. But, Doctor, what is it, more than anything else, that keeps prejudice going now, when so many people should know better? Well, one of the things that keeps prejudice going is the careless or ignorant statement. Now, there will always be people who will pick up the wrong information and will pass it out to anyone who would like to listen. And unfortunately, there are those then who would listen to this information and pass it off as fact. All right. How would you answer this statement? The Jews are the Christ killers. They tried to destroy the Christian religion. That's an easy one. Pontius Pilate, who ordered the execution of Christ, was a Roman. And the soldiers who carried out the order were Roman. However, Christ's 12 disciples were Jews. The people who got Christianity going after Christ's death were ethnically and religiously Jews. And for those people who would dismiss all of that because Judas was Jewish, Christ was a Jew too. Okay. Statement number two. Negroes are never going to get any place in today's world because they're just plain bone lazy. Obviously, the guy who says that has no idea what it's been like to be a black in America. Until recently, it was almost impossible for a black to get a decent education in this country. So historically, he's had to settle for the lowest jobs, the dirtiest, and often the most dangerous in order to just survive. And even if he worked hard at it, prejudice would keep him from rising any further. It's almost as if every time he came to bat, he was forced to wear a blindfold. And how many people would continue to try hitting home runs under those conditions? What would you say to all these people who make that kind of statement? Well, the simplest answer is you just don't make them. And that if you hear them, try to correct them. But the best thing for all of us is to start thinking of human beings as individuals 
rather than primarily in those old categories such as ethnic background, nationality, religion, race, sex, and even that of age. Dr. Catano, what do you feel is the future of prejudice in America? It is my observation and the opinion of other social scientists that the single most important sign is that we are finally becoming aware of some of the problems caused by prejudice. When we translate this awareness into positive action, we may then begin to see the beginning of the end to America's prejudice hang-ups. America is changing. Maybe not as fast as some of us would like, but certainly faster than it has before. More and more people are finding out that it's their own hang-ups that make them prejudiced. They're discovering how much better they like themselves, how much better living with themselves can be when they live better with other people. Just think how much duller our world would be without all the contributions of all those other people. For instance, this statue, the Pietà by Michelangelo, and the music of Verdi, a couple of wops, and Catholics, and one of them a homosexual. This Picasso painting. The music by Villa Lobos, both a couple of specks. Or this picture by Charles White, and the music of Duke Ellington, a couple of niggers. And this beautiful music by Chopin, a Pollock, being played by Foot Song, a chink. And me, I'm a chap. And me, I'm just a honky. <laughs>